Welcome to your daily dose of Poverty Proof. How the rich think differently and how you can train your brain for wealth. Today we ask and answer an important question. Why do there seem to be two sets of solutions to the problem of poverty and why are they mutually exclusive? This comes from the first chapter of the best-selling book Poverty Proof, 50 Ways to Train Your Brain for Wealth. Here's something strange. Perform an online search for the leading causes of poverty and you will very quickly discover a consensus. Everyone seems to know exactly what they are and exactly how they should be solved. Poverty relief groups from all over the world dominate the search results and they all list very much the same ideas. They will tell you that the causes of poverty include forces like climate change, inequality, and the limited capacity of governments to provide infrastructure and social welfare to their people. It all sounds perfectly logical. But then try this. Read properly researched studies about how wealth is actually created and why some people become wealthy while others do not. Something very strange will jump out at you. The answers do not correspond. They are not the opposites of the so-called causes. If the answers did correspond, then books on how to escape poverty and become wealthy would contain solutions like to make people wealthy, we should solve climate change. They don't. Studies on creating genuine wealth, the ones that carefully document real advances and replicable principles, don't even mention climate change. It's a non-factor. Or, to solve poverty, we need to make everyone equal. That is called socialism. We've tried it many times before around the world. In every place it has been attempted, it has consistently made everybody poorer, usually much poorer, and it tends to give rise to dictatorships. Venezuela is just the latest example. Did you know that their socialist government has made it illegal to report a baby perishing of starvation in a hospital? Because doing so makes socialism look bad. Socialism has equality as its goal. Yet inequality is actually one of the great signs of growth. Where there is zero inequality, you can also bet that there is zero entrepreneurship, invention or innovation. Entrepreneurship necessarily creates inequality and that's not a bad thing. If three people were poor, then one of them started a business and became rich. That's inequality. And it's also an improvement. Objection. Are you saying that inequality is a good thing? Answer. Yes. Oh, make no mistake. We don't want inequality before the law. We don't want inequality of rights. Those are terrible things. But inequality of wealth and earnings? That is a sign of a healthy, vibrant economy. It's not the inequality itself that matters, and it shouldn't be our goal to solve inequality. The goal is to help poor people to become wealthier. That's very different. All these sources might suggest, to alleviate poverty, we should extend the welfare state. I believe very strongly in charity, but this much is a certainty. Government grants do not solve poverty. They incentivize it. Studies reveal that reliance on government grants tends to make large groups of people, and especially black people, much poorer over time. In Wealth and Poverty, George Gilder shows that every time governments increase social welfare spending, they dampen the compulsions to work and produce, which are the very creators of wealth. He writes, The defenders of the welfare state tend to assume that the welfare state has a massive effect on the condition of the needy, but little impact on their willingness and ability to fend for themselves. Much evidence, however, indicates the opposite that the programs have surprisingly little beneficial effect, but they do have a dramatic negative impact on motivation and self-reliance. So, what exactly is going on here? It's as if there are two separate conversations, and they are completely different. The key is to realize, yes, there are two conversations, and they have nothing in common. One is about political ideology. It seeks greater control for governments. 
To achieve greater control, it needs more people dependent on social welfare. It needs people to believe that the only solution to environmental issues is more control for the government. And it seeks to level out differences between people by, once again, expanding government control. Did you notice how many times the word control appeared there? By contrast, reputable wealth literature barely even talks about governments. Where it does, it tends to make the opposite case, generally advocating that governments should get out of the way and free up businesses and entrepreneurs. Where governments do so, people prosper to degrees undreamt of by our ancestors. It's called capitalism, and as Yuval Harari demonstrated in Sapiens, A Brief History of Humanity, it's the most successful idea in all of human history. Nothing we have ever done has lifted more people out of poverty more quickly than this one idea. In terms of innovation and invention, it is also at the heart of what we do as human beings. No, the tried and tested studies and literature about genuine escape from poverty and about genuine wealth creation do not focus on things that are inflicted upon people. Instead, they do something very different. They all focus on things within people. They focus on the individual. And in particular, they focus on developing excellent qualities within the individual. Solving poverty turns out to be a matter of raising more excellent human beings who are taught certain values, traits, behaviors, and skills of thinking. For example, did you know that faithfully maintaining a family, as opposed to getting divorced or raising children as a single parent, is one of the most important factors in reducing poverty? Who teaches that as a wealth technique ever? But it is one and a very important one. Expanding welfare and giving a greater number of handouts actively discourages principles of personal excellence and even incentivizes family breakdown. In this way, the implied solutions to poverty turn out to be creators of poverty. Certainly, they appear compassionate. But that sort of compassion can do extraordinary damage. Thus, it's not really kindness. It's not really compassion. It's a trap. No, the real solutions are always centered around the thinking individual, you. That never changes. And it doesn't matter where on earth you are. And I will show you why shortly, as we consider a group of people who prosper everywhere they go. Meanwhile, here's another strange thing about those websites. They do not list a single self-inflicted cause of poverty. None. All of the alleged causes are outside forces, supposedly visited upon poor people, like evil spirits in the night, or plagues born on the wind. The personal choices made by people in poverty are never even mentioned. Yet the data shows that the two greatest determinants of upward mobility are both, in fact, personal choices. A study by the Institute for Research on Poverty at the University of Wisconsin found that these two things have more bearing on your upward mobility than anything else. 1. Work ethic your personal work ethic is the single greatest determinant of whether or not you will become upwardly mobile. Naturally, the more smart techniques you learn and add to your hard work, the more quickly you will amplify its effectiveness. Welfare programs substantially reduce work ethic by effectively paying people not to work. Socialism and communism obliterate work ethic by removing incentive. 2 monogamous marriage and family. Do you maintain a monogamous marriage and family? I'm not moralizing here. It's simply a wealth technique. It is the second surest determinant of your escape from poverty and ultimate financial success, and its impact upon your children's chances of prosperity cannot be overstated. Tim Ohai, the founder and international director of Ubuntu Mission, agrees, and he should know, as someone who sees both sides of this coin, 
Tim is also the founder and president of a successful company in the U.S. called Growth and Associates, and the author of two books on sales. Tim is a good friend of mine. He comes out to South Africa in a missionary capacity to help teach business and leadership skills in disadvantaged communities. He is himself a self-made, wealthy individual who is now trying to coach others in how to become wealthy themselves, work he does for free. He observes, Hard work matters. No one has ever made their money and kept it without working hard. Yes, there are people who get their money quickly, but if you dig into their story, if you track their journey, they almost always lose that money just as quickly. But when you work hard, you create a momentum that you will carry to and through the next milestone of success. In Wealth and Poverty, George Gilder says that if work effort is the first principle of overcoming poverty, marriage is the prime source of upwardly mobile work. Being married, it turns out, dramatically increases your work effectiveness, which in turn increases your potential for wealth. So, if these two choices are the surest determinants of human poverty or wealth, why aren't their absences listed as leading causes of poverty? Once again, it's as though these sites intend to prop up the narrative that poverty is something inflicted upon people and not something that they can change. I'm not the only one who finds this strange. Isabel Sawhill, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and author of several books on wealth and poverty, has spent a lifetime studying social mobility. She has won numerous awards for her contributions. Isabel is convinced that personal choices surrounding marriage and work are the greatest determinants of upward mobility. Nevertheless, when she points this out, citing studies and statistics that prove it to be true, she is often surprised to find that she is attacked for being unkind to poor people. She believes that this liberal viewpoint is profoundly misguided and ultimately does damage to poor people by denying them the truth. Once you know the truth, of course, you can act on it. Until then, you're simply floundering around in the dark, repeating mistakes that impoverish you, or worse, remaining dependent because you have been told that you are a perpetual victim. Sawhill refers to this problem of truth versus feelings as ideology versus reality, and she argues that the ideology isn't helping. Wealth is about how well you have trained your brain and how hard you work. Poverty is also about how poorly you have trained your brain and how little you work. If that sounds politically incorrect, then so be it. It is a farce to supplant real answers with kindly sounding falsities. So let's agree to seek out and speak the truth instead, even if it's hard to hear. Here is our first cornerstone of truth, which I would like you to take to heart. Poverty is not something that has been done to you. Wealth is not something that must be given to you. Poverty is a lack of the right knowledge and behaviors. And wealth is nothing more than acquiring and applying the right knowledge and behaviors. It's all about your thinking and your behaviors. And that means your future is in your hands.